Hi all and uh, welcome to another session of uh, vertical integration which we have started uh, with specific focus to uh, uh, MBBS students. Uh, today's topic is on systemic hypertension and for the discussion we have a very eminent panel. Uh, first let me introduce the panel to you. To my left uh, we have Dr. Girish Kumar sir, Principal and Professor of um, the School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Uh, Lakshmi from uh, the Department of Pharmacology and also Dr. Ledadambika Madam from the Department of Physiology. So we will be following the same usual pattern of uh, questions and to start with I will start with uh, Ledadambika Madam. Madam, uh, uh, how will you define uh, normal blood pressure and what are the factors which usually contribute to maintaining a blood pressure? Blood pressure actually is defined as the lateral pressure exerted by a contained column of blood on the walls of the blood vessels. So you have the walls of the blood vessels and the blood is there inside and it is exerting a pressure on the walls. That is what is normal blood pressure. Okay. And the factors that contribute to the maintenance of blood pressure, mainly there are two factors, cardiac output and okay. peripheral resistance. There are also other factors like viscosity of the blood the total blood volume and elasticity of the blood vessel which also maintain the BP. Right. But normally in day to day thing if you see only the cardiac output and peripheral resistance show much variation mm -hmm. because your total blood volume normally it's 5 liters and it is going to be 5 liters unless you have something like you are taking IV fluids or you are having MRH or something right. reading that is reducing the total blood volume right. and elasticity also except in old age there are not much differences in the elasticity or day to day variation is not there right. and viscosity also is the same because it is by the blood cells and the plasma proteins. Mm -hmm. So mainly when we concentrate on cardiac output and peripheral resistance, this cardiac output is the amount of blood ejected from each ventricle per minute into the circulation. Okay. And it is 5 liters per minute. And this cardiac output depends on the mainly on the preload of the heart. Right. The end diastolic volume, the more the end diastolic volume, more blood will be ejected from the heart. Yes, and this cardiac output is what mainly determines what is called the systolic blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Systolic blood pressure is the maximum pressure during systole of the heart. And there is the peripheral resistance which is also an important factor. It contributes to what is called the afterload of the heart. Right. So greater the peripheral resistance, greater the load against which the blood has to be pumped. So after load is the force acting on the heart after it begins its contraction. And this peripheral resistance depends mainly on two factors. One is the viscosity of the blood, the right. other one is the diameter of the blood vessels. Okay. The diameter of the blood vessel contributes too much to the peripheral resistance because resistance is inversely proportional to 1 by R4. That is 4 times the radius, inversely proportional to 4 right. times the radius of the blood That's vessel. Right. So even a minor change in the blood vessel will affect the resistance very much. Right. And peripheral resistance mainly determines the diastolic blood pressure. Okay, ma'am. Uh, so, since we have cleared the normal part now, I'll move on to Girish sir. So, what is the cutoff beyond which we will say that it is hypertension? So, if you uh, follow up the hypertensive guidelines, what we, you, we understand is, previously it was uh, hypertension means above 120 and 80. But recent guidelines, JNC7 onwards, JNC7, 8 and onwards, what they are telling is less than 120, less than 80 is normal. That means 120-80 is hypertension. Actually, in clinical practice, it is not correct that 120-80 is not a hypertensive patient. Uh, it has created a lot of panic am among a lot of uh, doctors and patients because 120-80 has now become hypertensive patient. Okay. It is not like that in our clinical practice. What we know is 120-80 is not a hypertensive, but something above 120 and 80 can be considered as hypertension in our clinical pra practice. Okay. Some patients you can see uh, elderly individuals like 120-80 is the uh, hypertensive cutoff what we read uh, in various guidelines. But some elderly individuals, if you see the BP may be, systolic BP may be slightly elevated. Maybe because of like Madam told, their blood vessels are thick. That has created some falsely elevated BP for uh, like that type of patients, Arth arteriosclerosis. Maybe their BP may be 140, 80. Even then, according to the guideline, it is hypertension. Actually, they don't have hypertension. 
so to know the exact bp we need to put a arterial line then only we can see what is their bp but for a general guideline purpose whatever uh, the bp above 120 80 should be considered as hypertensive patient and that to single reading will never tell you that this patient is hypertensive suppose you run uh, 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 half an hour or you do some heavy exercise your bp may be slightly higher that is only one point it is higher but if you are taking two three readings on the same day or repeated readings on different days suppose the patient is anxious bp can increase mm-hmm. all these things we have to rule out okay two three readings are required continuously bp should be elevated more than 120 80 then only we can brand that patient as a hypertensive patient mm-hmm. so for all practical purposes now we can uh, see that above 120 80 is considered as hypertensive but major guidelines like jnc 8 7 8 and all they tell that less than 120 80 is normal 120 80 there is no clear guidelines whether they are hypertensive or not hypertensive but practical purpose it is normal only thanks right. um i'll come back to lambia uh, madam madam uh, can you uh, tell in brief about the renin angiotensin mechanism and how it influences the bp control this renin angiotensin uh, aldosterone mechanism also called the das mechanism is a very important mechanism because it acts by adjusting the blood volume and thereby increasing or decreasing the blood pressure mainly uh, what happens is it's ve- it's very important for the long term regulation of the blood pressure right. and uh, whenever there is a l- less perfusion or where there is a hypoxia there are some cells called juxta glomerular cells in the kidney they are present in the afferent arterioles of the glomerulus so these cells they sense uh, even the sodium concentrations uh, which is sensed by the macular denser the information is passed to the juxta glomerular cells and they release a substance called renin mm-hmm. this renin converts a plasma protein called angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1 right this angiotensin 1 is again when it is going into the circulation mm-hmm. it is converted by a angiotensin converting enzyme this enzyme is mostly present in the lungs mm-hmm. it is also present in certain other tissues mostly in the lungs right. it converts the angiotensin 1 which is a 10 amino acid peptide okay. into a deca peptide okay. uh, which is converted into an octa peptide that is mm-hmm. 8 to amino acid angiotensin 2 right this angiotensin 2 is very important because that is bringing about a lot of actions which will increase the blood pressure right one is this angiotensin 2 is a peripheral vasoconstrictor so systemic arterioles can constrict because of the angiotensin 2 right second one it also has a direct action on the kidney and it increases the water reabsorption there in addition to that more important it acts on the adrenal cortex hmm. and it causes the secretion of aldosterone this hormone aldosterone can increase the sodium reabsorption in the renal tubules mm-hmm. along with sodium water is also reabsorbed so the blood volume is increased and bp will be increased okay. at the same time this angiotensin 2 so many actions it is acting having so it acts even in the hypothalamus and posterior pituitary gland releases adh anti diuretic hormone oh. and this also cause water reabsorption in the kidney so all these together will increase the volume blood volume mm-hmm. in the kidneys one more action is there it will stimulate the thirst center in the hypothalamus and make the person drink a lot of water mm-hmm. so all these together increase the bp normally what happens is when the bp is increased the renin secretion will be decreased yeah. but in certain conditions like suppose there is a renal artery stenosis mm-hmm. or some pathological conditions this mechanism thus mechanism is disrupted right. so that is one important reason then the renin secretion goes on continuing it is increased and that will increase the blood volume and the reason for edema also which we see in some cases so all this is uh, what is uh, affecting and this uh, mechanism actually is a very good mechanism in the control of bp mm-hmm. for the regulation of bp if you see the feedback gain of this ras mechanism is very high mm-hmm. and when there is a low bp it is playing a very effective role in raising the bp 
that is what is about the asthma right now since we have covered uh, the normal physiology and the normal blood pressure cutoffs one more question before uh, moving to others from madam madam uh, during the bp recording what are the usual phases we say that five phases are there and if you can the explain that recording actually what we are doing is an indirect method direct method means it's feasible only in animals we directly introduce yeah. a, into the cannula and see but here what we are doing is we are tying in the cuff in the upper arm and then we we are in inflating the cuff what we are doing is actually we are equating the brachial artery pressure with the pressure of air in the cuff and measuring the air pressure with the manometer right so here what we do is by palpatory method there are two methods palpatory and auscultatory by yes. palpatory method we are finding a rough value of the systolic blood pressure right and then what we do is we raise a little above this value 20 or 30 mm hg above this value we raise right. and then slowly we deflate the cuff at that time we will keep the stethoscope over the brachial artery in the inner aspect of the elbow right then we will start hearing certain sounds right. why these sounds are coming means actually the brachial artery is completely occluded when the cuff is inflated right so when you are deflating the cuff there comes a time when the occlusion is relieved and the blood gushes okay so that is producing a turbulence right when it reaches uh, more than the critical velocity there are certain things uh, in physics like the reynolds number yes, rho dv by eta yeah. so when it exceeds 2000 2500 you start getting sounds right. so these are the series of sounds we are hearing when we keep the stethoscope okay they are called the korotkov sounds right. after nikolov korotkov who found okay. out these series of sounds right now there are five phases okay. in the korotkov sounds the phase one is actually when the sounds begin there is turbulence and the sounds begin mm-hmm. and they are short tapping sounds mm-hmm. for 10 mm or something a g you will hear the short tapping sounds mm-hmm. then the sound changes a little it's like a murmurish sound that is phase 2 okay, okay. murmur then you get little loud tapping and clear sounds they are also called gong sound previously okay. they used to use the gong right. and it used to produce a good sound yes. so those are that is for 10 to 15 mm ag you get that phase 3 okay. okay. then it becomes muffled sounds right. the muffled sounds is phase 4 right. and the disappearance or the silence right. the disappearance of the sound is phase 5 okay here one thing is important usually the appearance of the sound that is phase 1 we take as the systolic blood pressure and the disappearance of the sound we take as the diastolic blood pressure right. but in some cases like okay. uh, cases like aortic regurgitation mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or sometimes when the circulation is very hyperdynamic or you will hear the sounds even till 10 or 0 mm hg sometimes in severe cases of aortic regurgitation so that time you can't take the disappearance you will take the muffled sounds as the diastolic blood pressure so these uh, series of sounds are called the quadrat cough sounds okay. and there are five phases as okay. i told you okay thank you ma'am just extending on the question on the uh, bp measurement to greet sir sir uh, what are the various methods in which in clinical practice we measure bp and what are the precautions which we usually need to take so before uh, going to that question we have recorded one video uh, to show how uh, rec- how to record the bp of a patient and before uh, and one more thing uh, when uh, what uh, routinely in our clinical practice is uh, when the patient come to opd we will ask the patient to sit sit on near to doctor and we immediately tie the cuff and see the bp it's actually wrong at least 30 minutes patient has to take complete rest on the chair he should not smoke he should not uh, take coffee tea all these things these are the pre requisition for the bp recording and at least 24 hours prior to the bp recording he should not take alcohol also okay these are the basic things and patient should not be tensed patient should not come after a long walk or running all these things are required then slowly we can like madam told we can tie the bp cuff adequate uh, like width of the cuff is very important then uh, remove the clothing tie the cuff then you can record that is the basic bp recording by a sigma uh, uh, manometer that is uh, mercury okay and we have other methods in icu what we use is we use uh, monitors for that but the best method is always uh, like uh, what we madam discussed it is, it is with mercury uh, manometer uh, but in icu we use another method that is invasive method madam told physiology they teach with uh, animals but in icu we can put a arterial line and we can monitor the bp 
that is required only if you require continuous monitoring like somebody is having a hypotension on vasopressors you want to monitor minute by minute bp reading that is needed or if your chromocytoma bp is very high or somebody is having raised icp you want continuously monitor the bp then you require arterial it has got its own uh, uh, like problems like uh, arterial uh, spasm can occur uh, the gangrene can occur so many complications also there but that is the best method because conditions like uh, madam has told about aortic regurgitation actually there is no uh, bp there mm-hmm. yeah. it is only because of the increased pumping yeah. or arteriosclerosis like previously it was arteriosclerosis is a thickening of the blood vessel actually bp is not there only because of the thickening you are getting increased bp all these conditions we can use it but uh, in our setup in our country we cannot use this arterial bp for all patients those who are admitting in icu you need to have a intensive bp monitoring then only we put it otherwise that is not required so routinely we all use uh, mercury manometer for uh, checking the bp that's all or other types of electronic devices are there but they are not accurate and we have recorded a complete uh, six step method how to check the bp that will show along with the video okay. right. today we are going to discuss the basic steps that is to be followed in measuring a blood pressure there are ideally six steps that is to be followed in making a proper blood pressure reading The first and the most important step is preparation of the patient. Then comes the proper technique of BP recording. The third step is measurement of systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. The fourth step is documentation of these readings. The fifth step is taking the average of the readings and final step is telling the patient the report both verbally and in writing. So first we come to the first and most important step that is preparation of the patient in preparation of the patient the patient should be adequately relaxed ideally in a sitting position for more than 5 minutes the patient should not take coffee any bp medications or done any exercises prior to the procedure the patient's bladder should be completely emptied and also the patient has not take any drugs or any medications that affect the bp and the patient's both arms should be adequately exposed then we come to measurement of the blood pressure the proper technique in assessing the blood pressure first the patient's arm should be at a resting position it should be adequately supported then we need to take the bp apparatus before that we need to proper hand wash and then use proper gloves before measuring the patient so first the bp apparatus should be checked it should be adequately calibrated we need to choose a adequate cuff size for the bp measurement and adequate cuff size means the bladder encircles the arm 80 percentage and the ideal position of placing the cuff pressure is the midpoint of the sternum or at the level of the right atrium so first we need to adequately hand wash wear gloves take the consent and check the bp apparatus it is calibrated then you need to support the patient's arm in resting position then you need to place and select an adequate cuff size that is A, the bladder size encircles 80 percentage of the arm and you need to place the cuff such that it is at the midpoint of the sternum at the level of the right atrium then we come to the third step that is measurement of the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure in this step we try two ways that is first we will take the os- the palpatory method followed by the auscultatory method first we come to the palpatory method in this procedure first we will palpate the patient's radial artery and we will inflate the cuff gradually at a point we should not palpate the pulse and this point marks approximately to the systolic blood pressure 
then we will gradually deflate at a rate of 2 millimeters of mercury per second. Then we come to the auscultatory method. Here we can use the diaphragm and bell of the stethoscope. So in auscultatory method, we have obtained the systolic blood pressure by the palpatory method. You will uh, increase the cuff pressure 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury above the palpatory method we have obtained and gradually you will deflate it at a rate of 2 millimeters of mercury per second. So the point which we hear the cork of sound marks the systolic blood pressure and gradually as you decrease the BP there is disappearance of the cork of sound and it marks the diastolic blood pressure. So first initially by palpatory method we have obtained the systolic blood pressure and we will increase the blood pressure 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury above that systolic blood pressure. Then we come to the auscultatory method where we will gradually decrease the blood pressure at a rate of 2 millimeters of mercury per second and the appearance of cork of sound marks the systolic blood pressure and the disappearance of cork of sound marks the diastolic blood pressure. So, then we come to the documentation and taking the average of these readings. Ideally, we have to take two or more recordings at two or more occasions apart. And these recordings should be documented and we need to take average of the document. You need to measure the blood pressure on both the arms at the first visit and the highest blood pressure should be taken. Then finally, we come to expressing the blood pressure to the patient. You need to convey this message both verbally and also in writing. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Lakshmi. So, uh, can you give a classification of antihypertensives? Yes. So, keep in mind what Madam has told the seat of control of hypertension. Ma'am mentioned the key role of the renin angiotensin system. She mentioned the peripheral vascular resistance and the cardiac output. So, keeping in mind, we need to block the effects of these systems and we'll go to the classification. For renin angiotensin system, Ma'am mentioned the synthesis. The most commonly used, most effective drugs for control of hypertension, one group is the AC inhibitors, inhibitors of the angiotensin converting enzyme, examples Ramipril, Enalapril. Together with that, we have angiotensin receptor blockers, which block the AT1 type of angiotensin receptors. Losartan, Telmisartan are examples of this group. Staying with the RAS system, remember also direct renin inhibitors, the drug called aliskiran. Since renin angiotensin system, the JG cells are in the kidney, you should also remember the role of the kidney in blood volume regulation. What are the drugs acting on the kidney to affect hyper, uh, BP? Diuretics. So the thiazide group of diuretics, hydrochlorothiazide, chlorthalidone are used in the management of hypertension. Now we'll go on to cardiac output. Which are the drugs directly acting on the heart? Beta blockers. They'll slow the heart rate, reduce the force of contraction, reduce cardiac output. Beta blockers like metoprolol, bisoprolol, nebivolol, that group. Then there is also central sympatholytics. Sympathetic system is also controlled. They are also, they are also used in the control of BP. They are alpha-2 agonists, clonidine, alpha-methyl, dopa. Then ma'am said peripheral vascular resistance is key. So there are drugs directly causing vasodilatation. Important ones among those are calcium channel blockers, nifedipine, amlodipine, nicardipine group. Then you have alpha blockers, mm -hmm. they are prazosin, doxazosin. Mm -hmm. You have other drugs which are add-on, mm -hmm. generally not used first line, but vasodilators like hydralazine, yeah. minoxidil, <coughs> sodium nitroprusside. Um, those drugs like phenol dopam yeah. these are all vasodilators and another add-on that i didn't mention is aldosterone antagonist also oh. you can remember it with the ras system spironolactone epilirinone group so these are the major drugs for hypertension okay now we have classified the drugs based upon the more like the mechanism of action and uh, most of the times we m might end up uh, using combinations rather than a single kind of drug in while treating hyp uh, hypertension so if you can say about what are the recommended combinations and what should not be used as combinations yeah so 
taking from the classification itself when you combine drugs when you give a single drug it's likely that the body tries to compensate and slowly the effect of that drugs slowly decreases so when you combine drugs try to combine drugs with different mechanism of action okay. so uh, the first line drugs for bp are ac inhibitor arbs mm -hmm. calcium channel blockers and thiazide diuretics so when you combine generally it is safe to combine all these three together okay. if you start with the ac inhibitor or arb you can add on a calcium channel blocker if bp is not controlled sufficiently still not controlled you can add on a diuretic okay. and there is no order like you should first add on this right. drug or first start that drug so you can add those on if still with the three first line drugs it's not controlled you can add on spironolactone one advantage is if there is hypokalemia due to thiazide spironolactone will bring up the potassium at the same time we have to remember to check because ac inhibitors also has the side effect so you can combine but often there is a certain element of caution that you have to use mm -hmm. and other combinations you can add beta blockers also if it is not controlled with the first line drugs combinations to avoid is clonidine with beta blocker mm -hmm. there if you uh, give these two the chance of rebound is very high right. and there is no advantage of combining it, it together mm -hmm. ac inhibitors arbs it's a question that we Mm -hmm. that comes to our mind should we combine the two it is just a sequential block there's no advantage of combining those two so about uh, we should avoid the combination of ac inhibitors and arb as well mm -hmm. then uh, when you are giving beta blockers older beta blockers or non selective beta blockers propranolol you have to take caution in diabetics thiazides also cause hyperglycemia so when you combine those drugs also you have to be very cautious mm -hmm. one more combination to avoid is the calcium channel blocker verapamil which mm -hmm. can also be used in hypertension it has a suppressive effect on av con av nodal conduction mm -hmm. or ar uh, atrioventricular conduction mm -hmm. the beta blockers also have the same effect so that additive block may slow the heart dangerously so you don't combine it in hypertension if you are using it for atrial fibrillation or high atrial rate there it may be beneficial but not in hypertension so these are some of the combinations okay now since we have cleared what are the classes of drugs and also what are the possible combinations i want to greet sir on a uh, from a clinical perspective what do we usually start as a first line in various conditions like based upon gender or uh, other comorbidities and things like that what would be the usual uh, way we treat hypertension here dr lakshmi has clearly told about uh, uses uh, correctly we follow the same uh, pattern only while treating the patient the if you are a doctor who like graduated 10 years back the first line drugs were a b c d uh, category a, a is ac inhibitor b is beta blocker c is calcium channel blocker d is diuretic during that time diuretic was the first choice and you can uh, second line as a second line you could use any other drugs but recently last year maybe two years back the guidelines have slightly changed that is b is not there a c d uh, guideline so like uh, doctor uh, told uh, we can use any of these drugs as first line drugs or you can use all the drugs uh, during uh, like as a first line drug like normally when uh, we get a patient who is having hypertension one of the best option will be starting on ac inhibitor or arb because uh, adverse effects are very limited very very rare in during uh, treatment of ac inhibitor or arb only problem is patients who, who like pregnant ladies this drug should be avoided ac and arb should be avoided in the pregnant lady otherwise this can be used like used in almost all condition but remember before starting ac or arb you have to check the potassium of the patient you have to check the creatinine of the patient pregnancy should be ruled out if creatinine is very high you cannot use ac or arb if potassium is already very high better to avoid these drugs so ac and arb has got a lot of advantages in uh, starting as a first line drug Uh, so that is one drug second uh, drug what madam told is uh, calcium channel blockers normally we use uh, amlodipine nifedipine silnidipine these are the routine as uh, calcium channel blockers we start the problem with this calcium channel blockers is rarely patient can have pedal edema some of the patients can have tachycardia that's why madam has already told you can combine beta blocker with 
calcium channel blocker the disadvantage of calcium channel blocker is it increases the heart rate beta blocker if you are adding as a second line drug it can control the heart rate but very rarely these patients can have pedal edema if you can counsel the patient and continue the calcium channel blocker it is better suppose the patient is not uh, like convinced with your counseling you can change to some other drug diuretic hydrochlorothiazide we are using as a first line drug yeah, some pa- uh, 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 some patients can have hypokalemia like madam told in that case you can add a, a potassium sparing diuretic to the regime okay so that can be done so first line drug will be ac arb or calcium channel blockers uh, like uh, uh, amlodipine nifedipine silnedipin all these things and a diuretic these are the first line drugs beta blockers used as first line drugs only in limited condition if the patient is having coronary artery disease patient is having cardiac failure like that conditions you can use beta blocker as a first line drug and remember uh, ac inhibitor and arb should be avoided in pregnancy hyperkalemia and renal failure otherwise these are the first line drugs you use in all conditions and suppose and one more problem is uh, when we start a handy hypertensive drug for any patient you have to wait at least 2 weeks to get a result of that because peak action comes only after that the problem with r- routine clinics are every day patient will be coming to check the bp after starting b- uh, drug so that anxiety itself can increase the bp so uh, after 2 weeks you check the bp suppose you are not satisfied with your uh, bp control you can either increase the dose of the drug or add another drug from this combination what three combination the, even after three first line drugs if bp is not getting control you go for second line drug unfortunately now beta blocker has gone to the second line drug so there is no point in starting beta blocker as a first line drug without a major indication for that so it is clear ac inhibitor or arb uh, calcium channel blocker or diuretic these are the four categories comes in first line one thing which we kind of missed or during the discussion was for work up of bp what are the essential things we need to like a quick run through if you can give sir okay. so when suppose i am sitting in my clinic and seeing a hypertensive patient when i am uh, seeing the bp suppose bp is high i need at least three uh, readings before branding that patient as hypertensive so i'll ask the patient to come after one week or one, uh, next week next two three weeks i'll be taking two three readings then i'll confirm that this patient is having hypertension and uh, again suppose i have doubt this may be a uh, white coat syndrome he is coming to hospital getting anxiety and bp is increasing i can take an ecg first line of investigation is should be always ecg because if the patient is having high bp which is not getting controlled persistently it is high means definitely the ecg may show some changes like lvh pattern okay so ecg is a very important tool in making a diagnosis of hypertension right. then echo if it is available you can use to confirm your findings in ecg if it is not there it's okay then basic investigations like you have to ask for a blood sugar so all diabetic all hypertensive patients diabetic uh, diabetes should be ruled out cholesterol should be ruled out because uh, suppose a patient is having only hypertension and another patient is having hypertension or diabetes hypertension with uh, dyslipidemia the risk of coronary vascular disease is almost double okay so if uh, sugar is there that should be treated well cholesterol is there that should be treated well then the third investigation will be creatinine the creatinine the elevated creatinine or kidney disease itself can produce high bp and high bp on long term can produce uh, kidney failure so creatinine is a third investigation then electrolytes in electrolytes most important is potassium like madam told potassium can be uh, low in some types of hypertension like uh, Uh, if there is hormonal disturbance like secondary hypertension corn syndrome and all potassium can be low or if the patient is already on diuretics that itself can reduce potassium one of the advantage of potassium is it, it itself can reduce the bp so the hypokalemia can increase the bp so you have to check the potassium then thyroid function test is very important because hypothyroidism and hypertension is like brother and sister you have uh, hypothyroidism most of the patient will have hypertension okay so that should be basic investigations are that only then suppose you uh, feel that it's a long term hypertension fundus examination eye fundus examination should be done because 
the basic problem in hypertension is vasculopathy blood vessels are involved so to see that you have to see the fundus okay then if the patient you are suspecting a secondary hypertension abdominal ultrasound with doppler study is if the patient develops hypertension after 50 years doppler is a must okay. then if you have a, uh, evidence for secondary hypertension only you need to do lot of other investigation otherwise basically this is enough right. to make a proper diagnosis and treat the patient okay sir uh, coming to back to madam madam you did uh, mention about the peripheral vasculature so if you can elaborate on the role of uh, peripheral baroreceptors and peripheral vasculature in maintenance of bp1 <laughs> when i told about the vas mechanism i was telling that it is a long term mechanism yeah. so there are some short term mechanisms in the regulation of uh, blood pressure right. so these baroreceptors mechanism that is a reflex mechanism nervous mechanism nervous mechanism means it acts within a fraction of few seconds itself it acts right. so this is a very important mechanism regarding the baroreceptors in the regulation of bp because moment to moment variation mm -hmm. sometimes when you cough or when you even do the micturition or some act mm -hmm. there is a variation in your bp but it has to be immediately adjusted right. and especially when you change the postures when you are lying down when you get up immediately certain adjustments has to take place to mm -hmm. adjust your bp to the normal level so that is by these peripheral baroreceptors okay. and these baroreceptors they are situated in the carotid sinus which is a dilatation of the internal carotid artery mm -hmm. uh our just at the beginning that's the dilatation okay. and there is the aortic arch so these are nerve endings actually these receptors are nerve endings only mm -hmm. they are the endings of the ninth nerve right. and the 10th nerve okay. ninth means glossopharyngeal and the 10th is the vagus ninth nerve carry the impulses from the carotid sinus 10th nerve vagus carries from the aortic arch mm -hmm. the impulses go to the medulla there are centers in the medulla the medulla that the centers called nucleus of tractus solitarius from there the impulses again go to certain areas like previously the nomenclature was depressor area pressor area but nowadays they use the terms cordoventral lateral medulla the ostral ventral lateral medulla so first it goes to cordoventral lateral medulla it stimulates that area with glutamate okay. as the transmitter then the transmitter from cordoventral lateral medulla to the rostral ventromatal medulla which is the previous pressor area mm -hmm. that is uh, gaba it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter okay. so whenever there is increased bp more number of impulses are going through the baroreceptors mm -hmm. when the more number of impulses are going and there is an inhibition of this rostral ventromatal lateral medulla which is concerned with the sympathetic action mainly from their projections go to the intermedio lateral horn in the spinal cord from where the sympathetic are originating mm -hmm. the heart is supplied from t1 to t5 segments mm -hmm. of the spinal cord the intermedio lateral horn gives the sympathetic nerves they form a plexus and they are supp uh, supplying the heart and whenever the sympathetic is stimulated it will increase the heart rate conductivity everything is increased by the sympathetic okay. so here what happens mainly it will act on the vessels also because this pressor area is having a response on the diameter of the blood vessels very important in the regulation of the peripheral resistance okay. and the seat of the peripheral resistance is in the arterioles okay. arterioles are the ones which are having a lot of smooth muscles and it can adjust the caliber very much so here from here the impulses go and what they because it is inhibited now there is vasodilatation of the blood vessels okay. and also sympathetics are reduced the activity is reduced so heart rate will reduce mm -hmm. whenever heart rate reduces because heart rate and stroke volume de determines the cardiac output heart rate into stroke volume is cardiac output so cardiac output will that you so both these factors when cardiac output as well as peripheral resistance are decreasing right. they will decrease the bp this happens when there is an increased bp same thing when there is a decreased bp what happens is less number of impulses go so when less number of impulses goes everything it happens in the opposite way so the pressor response is increased now because there is less inhibition of the rostroventral mm -hmm. lateral medulla so this will increase the peripheral resistance and cardiac output and increase bp this is how the bp is getting normally adjusted Okay. but uh, there is one more center cardio inhibitory center in the medulla this uh, doesn't uh, regulate the peripheral resistance at all it okay. only determines the heart rate because it is made of the dorsal nucleus of vagus and nucleus ambiguus mm -hmm. these have action the parasympathetic the vagus supply the heart 
right vagus and the left vagus are the ones which are supplying the heart and they have they reduce the heart rate when they are stimulated whenever they are stimulated so when there is high bp they are stimulated so that will reduce the heart rate so that action reduces the cardiac output and it will decrease the bp so this is the mechanism which regulates bp but in a person with chronic hypertension when the bp is uh, at a higher level then what happens why doesn't this mechanism act that is a question which comes in our mind right. so here the bathor receptor reflex always they have a range okay. oh 60 to 180 and sometimes even from 50 to 200 it can act in that range this bathor receptor reflex will act very well uh, but uh, in chronic hypertensives if the hy- blood pressure remains high for a period of time like two or three days these bathor receptor reflex they are set at a higher level so they don't function for the normal range of the blood pressure so they are set at a higher level so they don't imply for these type of patients that is the human cancer okay thank you ma'am so coming back to girish sir uh, so we have uh, discussed mostly about the outpatient management in hypertension but in er something of more concern will be hypertensive emergencies and urgencies if you can uh, tell what it is and how do you manage it hypertension emergency and urgency both are almost equal only thing is a slight uh, uh, variation in the definition okay emergency means end organ damage is also associated with a high bp okay high bp if you search different guidelines different books they might have written 200 120 180 120 uh, 220 by 120 various guidelines says uh, different types of bp stroke guideline if you see that's a different bp i my my cardiac infarction it's a different bp whatever it is end organ damage is associated with high bp then it is emergency okay otherwise it is urgency whatever it is we have to control the bp only problem is some conditions our control should be slow some uh, conditions our control should be fast for example patient is having pulmonary edema with high bp mm-hmm. unless until you control the pulmonary edema uh, or hypertension you have to control both so you control suppose patient is having cardiac failure with pulmonary edema high bp if you don't control the bp pulmonary edema is not going to come down so there it's an uh, it's a very urgent condition you have to reduce the bp within 1 hour or 2 hour by do, uh, giving some uh, iv infusions like uh, hemorrhagic stroke okay. there also you have to control the bp very fast okay patient who is having high bp with the tachyarrhythmias you have to control the bp and heart rate very fast other, other conditions like a patient who is having a stroke who is having high bp slightly higher bp like 120 180 by 110 that may be a mechanism to uh, prevent the damage of the uh, ischemic penumbra so you should know what is the scenario then only we can control the bp some condition we need to reduce the bp drastically to a normal level like p- patient is having pulmonary edema you have to control the bp very fast Uh, uh, like conditions like uh, preeclampsia eclampsia there also you have to control the bp very fast but unfortunately unless until you take the patient for delivery this is not going to get controlled so there that is the end point of the bp so that difference is always there you, uh, one condition uh, uh, bp is very high end organ damage is there that is hypertensive emergency other condition high bp uh, but there is no end organ damage so what are the, these end organ damages like i told pulmonary edema is one end organ damage hypertensive encephalopathy patient is having altered behavior seizure all these things it's an encephalopathy okay renal failure patient is having acute renal failure and patient is having high bp that is also end organ damage basically what should what we should understand is both this hypertension and diabetes they all act on your blood vessel and they destroy the blood vessel and ultimately what happens this all blood vessel small small supply to various organs are getting damaged like if you have a chronic hypertension you can see the fundus there you can see the arteries you can see the arterial changes same type of changes are going to occur in your kidneys in your heart in your brain everywhere so that eventually that will produce a, whenever there is a high bp that can rupture or it can get blocked and can have ischemia or infarction or bleed whatever it is that will go to Uh, emergency if that is not happening uh, on visually we are not seeing but internally it is going to, it is happening so that is a basic difference between emergency and urgency once you understand that you know how to reduce the bp some condition you need a faster reduction some condition you need to reduce the bp by 24 hours that is enough so which all the drugs that we can use that is also very important 
so previously we used to give hydralazine when we had injection hydralazine that was one of the first line drugs we used to uh, use in these type of conditions but now we don't have iv hydralazine so we almost all conditions who is having an hypertensive emergency labetalol is a one of the drug of choice now we are using but condi- uh, iv labetalol is one of the condition sorry one of the drug we use in almost all conditions but one condition like a patient who is having pulmonary edema and uh, hypertensive emergency and cardiac failure associated cardiac failure uh, hypertension pulmonary edema there when we are using beta blocker we have to be very uh, uh, cautious because beta blocker acutely it can suppress the myocardial contraction so the better drug there it will be uh, uh, this ntg ntg infusion so that is the only condition ntg has got a edge over beta labetalol so all other conditions you can use safely beta blockers uh, including pheochromocytoma because pheochromocytoma one of the problem is you have to start alpha blocker then only you can start beta blocker but fortunately labetalol has got both alpha blocker and beta blocking activity even then you may have to add at least one alpha blocker along with the labetalol otherwise almost all conditions uh, you can use labetalol except in uh, patient who is having cardiac failure you go for uh, ntg infusion uh, sodium nitroprusside nowadays we rarely use because of its side effects and uh, difficulty in uh, using that drug all these things uh, are there labetalol will be one of the best drug which can uh, be used in emergency room thank you sir coming to dr lakshmi we did mention about the various uh, drugs which are available to treat so what are the adverse effects one need to monitor when a patient is on anti hypertensives so whenever you have a pharmacological effect there will be some extension of the effect beyond what you desire so hypotension is something you can consider so do all the anti hypertensive commonly cause hypotension luckily not all of them seriously cause hypotension when you talk about ac inhibitors if the patient had a high renin level if their volume depleted their renin level may be high younger patients their renin level may be high in such cases there is some uh, first dose hypotension okay. especially in captopril the first ac inhibitor you so there there is a first dose hypotension which we manage by giving the drug at low dose starting it at low dose giving it at night other groups that can cause hypotension especially are alpha blockers the vasodilators so they can cause uh, postural hypotension or orthostatic hypotension and first dose hypotension because of the vasodilatory effect both venous and arterial pooling orthostatic hypotension so these two are more notorious to cause hypotension then uh, you can look at vasodilators as a group what are the group side effects vasodilator ma'am had explained about reflex mechanism there can be a reflex tachycardia then all vasodilators they'll tend to cause a little headache mm-hmm. and the reflex tachycardia will manifest as palpitations mm-hmm. these are uh, effects of all vasodilators mm-hmm. then uh, rebound hypertension is something that you have to educate the patient about especially if you are putting them on beta blockers and in resistant hypertension if you are adding clonidine it's very mm-hmm. important to explain to them that if you are going to stop this drug the bp is going to shoot up right. to dangerous levels right. so especially clonidine and beta blockers you have to explain this then going specifically to ac inhibitors mm-hmm. arvs ac inhibitors they are known to cause cough in about 10 to 15% patients Uh, so in those patients if they come back with cough you would change it to arbs that's because the reason for the cough is that ace is the enzyme that breaks down bradykinin so if you block ace more bradykinin levels cause cough and also angioedema can be seen with ac inhibitors which is not present for arbs the remaining adverse effects of this group are rash hyperkalemia the fetotoxic potential or the teratogenicity these are common to ac inhibitors arbs and aliskiren some blood disgrace dyscrasias have been seen with ac inhibitors too and uh, altered taste sensation or dysgeusia coming to beta blockers other than this rebound hypertension some uh, altered nightmares such complaints also come from patients ccb is a particular class side effect is pedal edema calcium channel blockers cause pedal edema thiazide diuretics metabolic side effects are seen 
some uh, loss of diabetic control mm -hmm. hyperlipidemia hyperuricemia and electrolyte abnormalities hypokalemia hyponatremia are also seen these are the common side effects of the drugs we are m using the most Thank you. So, uh, we are done with the pre-prepared questions. The last round, starting with uh, Madam. So, Madam, I think we have covered most of the uh, relevant questions under this topic. Uh, but if at all I have missed anything, can you just elaborate on what are the expected questions for undergraduate students from the topic of hypertension? Ma'am. So, actually, uh, all definitions will be asked in the uh, blood pressure chapter and uh, with the hypertension. So, they will ask uh, even what is pulse pressure that we have not discussed. It is the difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure that is called the pulse pressure. Then there is something called mean arterial pressure. Actually, it is not the arithmetic mean here, but actually it is a diastolic pressure plus one third pulse pressure. Why we are taking like this is because of the cardiac cycle. The duration of ventricular systole is only 0.3 second, whereas diastole is longer duration, 0.5 second. So we can't take the arithmetic mean. So a standard deviation is plotted and they have derived with this formula. So that also usually we ask in the exam. Then factors uh, uh, maintaining BP, what I discussed last, the determinants, they are called the determinants of blood pressure that is an important question then uh, factors affecting BP like age, sex, gravity so many other factors also have an uh, effect on BP that is also asked for them factors affecting BP even the child there is a difference and adult there is a difference in the normal blood pressure so those are asked then uh, regulation of BP is a very important question short term regulation is there long term regulation short term we have discussed baroreceptor reflex there is another one reflex called chemoreceptor uh, uh, chemical regulation of uh, peripheral uh, receptors. So there what happens is when the PO2 is less or PCO2 is increased, these receptors are stimulated and uh, they will bring an increase in the peripheral resistance. There also the peripheral vasculature is the one which is most affected. It will increase peripheral resistance and it will increase BP. Right. But it comes only when the BP is falling below 70. When the mean blood pressure balls below 70, only chemoreceptor reflex comes. That is asked in the exam for them. Then there is one uh, the, uh, reflex called CNS ischemic response. In an emergency, very dire the emergency, when the patient's BP is falling, the out traffic accident or something, when it's falling below 40, that is an emergency situation. There what happens is, this vasomotor center I told you in the brain, which contains the rostral, ventrolateral medulla, caudal ventrolateral, it is directly stimulated by the carbon dioxide in the brain. So you don't have the, the nerves carrying the impulses here. Direct stimulation of the vasomotor center which is causing a very a drastic peripheral resistance increase because all the blood vessels constrict and try to push the blood to the brain and heart, the vital organs. Mm -hmm. So that is a CNS ischemic response and uh, that uh, that is asked uh, usually. Mm -hmm. Then long term mechanisms are there. The renal body fluid mechanism and mechanism is there by adjusting the filtration in the kidney. Okay. It works. And uh, then the last mechanism and uh, hypertension also we ask in physiology sometimes okay. basics like uh, right. the uh, types of hypertension essential okay. and uh, secondary okay. hypertension okay. Those are thank you same question dr lakshmi pharmacology also generally classification of antihypertensives the uh, first line drugs in detail central sympatholytics also in detail they may be asked to choose between two drugs given a particular uh, clinical condition then uh, drugs safe in pregnancy and management of hypertensive emergency urgency are also commonly asked questions okay. sir one important question is classification of hypertension from medicine point of view that is very important then uh, classification of uh, drugs that same thing uh, madam has told uh, both in pharmacology and medicine they ask uh, classification of uh, drugs each drug in detail also they can be asked like uh, beta blockers in hypertensive patient like that they can uh, ask investigations in a hypertensive patient is another major question and uh, most of the question papers repeatedly asking question is always uh, this hypertensive emergency and urgency management in ER okay that is uh, seen in many questions in papers uh, across India. So many universities that questions are repeated. Thank you, sir. And thank you all for this such a dynamic and informative uh, discussion. Thank you.